Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Lesson this evening. Okay, good, it is up. Uh, we're going to be talking about the covenant. You may recall that in the past several weeks that we've been going through, we've been discussing this concept of Jesus as the high priest. And what we're going to see tonight is sort of a transition, not away from that concept, but into a different aspect of that idea. So, so far what has been discussed is the idea of Jesus holding a priestly office. But we're going to see a transition in chapter 8, which we're going to be going through tonight, and then into chapter 9, where it transitions away from the focus on the office of the priest and into the functions of the priesthood. So we're kind of moving away from who Jesus is into what Jesus does as the high priest. And so we're going to see that transition take place in chapter 8. Chapter 8 is kind of the bridge between these two concepts. So we'll go ahead and read the first few verses of it. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. So we're seeing this transition start to take to take shape here that he's going to start moving away from the office of, of who Jesus is and move into what he does. And so you see that transition starting in verses 2 and 3 where it talks about him being seated in the throne of heaven, but also that he's a minister. And so that's the word that's kind of the key here. Uh, this is a word that in the Greek is not used very often in the New Testament. And this is the only time where it's actually used to refer to something Christ does. Usually it is used to refer to uh, either priests or angels. But this is the occasion where it's actually used there. And so we see this transition into this focus about being not just that Jesus holds the office of a priest, but also that he performs the duties of a priest as well. And so we're going to be emphasizing those this evening. And if you look in verse 2 where it talks about this being the, the true tabernacle, you see this as being somewhat of a continuation of the concepts that we have been discussing already. Because you may recall that in the past couple of weeks where we're contrasting the priesthood of the Levitical priesthood, Aaron's priesthood in other words, with the priesthood of Melchizedek, one of the big points of contention and one of the arguments that the Hebrew author makes is he's saying the Melchizedekian priesthood is eternal. It's everlasting. It has no beginning. It has no end. That can't be said of the priest of Aaron because Aaron's high priest for a while and then he dies and then Eleazar is priest for a while and then he dies and then Phineas is priest. For, and, and it's this continuation through the generations. They don't retain their priesthood after death. And that's not the case in the case of Jesus' priesthood. And we're going to see a similarity drawn here. That we have the old tabernacle, which by its very nature was transitory. It was erected. It had an establishment. It had a sanctification process where it became the tabernacle. And then after time, the tabernacle faded away because they were no longer nomadic. And it moved into the temple. And the temple was destroyed. And they moved into the second temple. And we know that... This hasn't happened yet when Hebrews is being written, but the second uh, temple is about to be destroyed as well. And so these are all temporary things. Just like the tabernacle was made by human hands, it was instructed and sanctified by God, but it was made with human hands, with actual physical material things. And the same is true of the temple of Solomon, and the same is true of the second temple that was erected. None of that is true with the tabernacle that Jesus enters and offers sacrifice in, and that is what makes it superior. And if this theme is the superiority of Christ, not only is Jesus himself superior, but the tabernacle in which he offers sacrifices is also superior to the old tabernacle. And one thing that is interesting here, this is sort of a literary device that is being used, is 
in verse 3, where you see it, it's talking about the high priest are going to be offering gifts and sacrifices, and he says that Jesus, in similar fashion, has something to offer. And so this is really interesting because he's kind of hinting at something that is going to be discussed in detail later, but he doesn't discuss it right here. And so I think that this is kind of a cliffhanger device. You may see this sometimes, we've probably heard it in sermons before, where a speaker will introduce his topic and then just kind of leave the audience hanging and go on to something else. And the reason is because he's wanting to plant that idea in the audience's head and let them kind of think about it themselves for a little bit. And so it seems to be that is what is going on, because of course, Jesus is a priest that offers sacrifices and gifts. But for now, the Hebrew author kind of leaves it up to the reader to decide what exactly that means and, and what all that entails. And so he plants that idea and then just kind of changes subjects here that we'll see in the next verse so that the reader has time to kind of keep that in the back of their head and ponder that before he gets to his main point. So let's look at verses 4 through 6. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For, see, he says that you will make all things by the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. So one thing you notice very quickly in verse 4 here is that the priests are serving in the temple according to the law. And if there are already priests that are serving in the temple, and when this is being written, by the way, I think that this particular section of Scripture is probably the single best piece of evidence that Hebrews is written before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that he talks about it in present tense as though there are people that are occupying the office of priest. That was not the case after the temple was destroyed. And so this is a really crucial piece of evidence that the book of Hebrews was probably written before 70 AD. And he talks about it as though the priests are already here He's saying that if Jesus were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest because there's already people serving that function in Israel. And so now that Jesus has died, he has entered the heavenly places. He is in the true tabernacle. He is occupying the higher office, the better office of priesthood that has been promised. And so the tabernacle and the office of the priest that he's been discussing this whole time they're merely shadows and copies. That's the concept that he's really driving at here, that this is just a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So think about it like a diamond. You know, when we see a diamond, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between a diamond and a copy of a diamond unless you know what to look for. But there are certain signs that you can use to determine which one's the real one and which one is the copy. But you'll notice that when they make the copy, they're doing the best that they can to make the copy similar to the real thing. That's the point of a copy, isn't it? And so there's going to be those similarities that we know are going to occur there. When you're trying to make a, a copy of a great work of art or something like that, if you're trying to make a facsimile of it, then it's not going to be as good as the genuine article. We understand this. And so it's an interesting sort of twist that the Hebrew author is trying to uh, bring about here is that he's talking about these things as though they are a copy and a shadow. And the interesting thing is, you could kind of look at it, especially because of the chronology of it, as though all of these things that are being set up, okay, well, now Jesus is a priest like they were the priests. Actually, what he's suggesting is the exact opposite that the priesthood was significant because it mirrored Christ, not the other way around. Jesus is the genuine article. His priesthood is the true priesthood. His tabernacle is the true tabernacle. Everything else was only significant because it reminded humankind of what the true thing was going to look like when it came. And so they're actually the copy. There's a great analogy for this. In the last chapter of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series. The final book in that series, which 
depicts basically the destruction of Narnia and, and the end of the whole story. And I hate that I'm giving away that spoiler, but that book's like 80 years old now, so I think I'm, I'm safe in there. If you haven't read it, you really should. Its description of heaven that, that Lewis gives in that book series is that there are certain things that are kind of like things that they knew, like the professor's house that you may remember if you read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or different locales in Narnia. And there's a line that Peter gives. He says, I finally get it. The reason I loved those places is because they were pointing to this place. And they referred to what we would call the, the current world or the old Narnia as the Shadowlands after that point. And so it's the same kind of idea that is being presented here. Whereas someone who is familiar with the Old Testament and the New Testament is a new concept to them might be tempted to think, oh, these things are significant because they're like Moses or they're like Aaron or they're like the Old Testament and the sacrificial system. The Hebrew author is very careful to point out, no, it's the opposite. Those things are important because they are like Jesus. They are a foreshadowing of things to come. And so uh, one, one way that we can look at this is if you're looking at verse 5 in particular, and talking about this idea of, of it being a shadow and that Moses warned by God when he was erecting this tabernacle. And the quote that he gives here, he says, be very careful to make it in the pattern in which I have shown you. What does that tell you? That the tabernacle that is actually created is just a shadow of the vision that God showed Moses. And by the way, this occurs several times in the Pentateuch where the, the tabernacle is, also, is either called a pattern or a shadow or some kind of copy. This happens in Exodus 25.40, 25.9, 26.30, 27.8, and Numbers 8.4. So the whole purpose of Moses erecting the tabernacle in the way that he was was just trying to make something similar to what God had shown him. And so even the tabernacle by Moses' own admission in the Pentateuch, is just fashioning it after the pattern which God had shown him. So even that tabernacle is merely a shadow of what God had given him to work with. And so uh, one thing that I do want to, to bring to your attention is in all of this and all the language he's used so far, he doesn't go back to the second temple. He doesn't go back to Solomon's temple. He keeps going back to the tabernacle of Moses. Why do you think he chooses to draw on that as a shadow? Because, of course, the temples would have also fit this analogy. Why does he choose to keep going back to the tabernacle of the desert rather than the temples that were erected in Jerusalem? Okay, so there's, there's a proximity there to the law of Moses, right? So th that's the one that is specifically directed in the law of Moses. And because of that, he's drawing that closeness uh, to it because the, the temple is separated by you know, given somewhere between three to 500 years. And so th there is, um, it is much closer to the old law if you're talking about the tabernacle that's commanded to be built there. So that, that's definitely one aspect of it. Any other thoughts? Okay, so because Moses is held in higher esteem, maybe it's important to go back to the tabernacle because that was the temple that Moses sanctioned and oversaw its, its, its erection. So yeah, th there could be that. He's trying to draw on the significance of, of Moses. Um, one other thing that I think it may be is because since the whole purpose of this conversation that he's having here is about shadows and copies and things that are similar to other things, I think you could make the argument that if you were drawing back to the temple, whether it's the first or the second temple, and you're like, well, they were just shadows and copies, and the, the rebuttal to that may be, well, duh, they were just shadows and copies because David and, or not David, Solomon and then the, the, the second temple Israelites erected those specifically to model the tabernacle. And so it's a more effective argument if you go back to the original and point to that and say, no, no, it's superior even to that. And so I, I thought that those were both good points. And I think also that there may be a little bit of rhetorical um, groundwork laying, if that makes sense, to try to set up his argument to say, this is the purest, the oldest, the one that is closest to Moses, 
And Jesus is serving in the true version of that. It is superior even to the tabernacle that Moses himself oversaw. And the Greek, the Greek word here uh, for the word pattern is uh, tupos, which interestingly enough literally means to blow and then the effect of the blow. Um, so like if you were to, for example, to blow on a pinwheel and the pinwheel starts spinning, the tupos is not the breath itself, but it's the breath combined with the effect of the breath, which would be the spinning pinwheel. And so when he's talking about a pattern, it's a very derivative kind of word. But if we also look at it from the idea that the word inspiration is literally the breath of God or God breathed out, then we can see the tabernacle as sort of the effect of God's inspired word coming down and being passed on to Moses so that the tabernacle could then be erected. And so in that same sense, we can understand the significance of the tabernacle. This is not degrading the tabernacle. It's actually uplifting. The tabernacle is saying it's very important. But as important as it is, it is merely the effect of the thing for which it was always intended. And so at the same time, while he's sort of uplifting the tabernacle in importance, he's also saying, but ultimately always remember that the true tabernacle, God's true dwelling place, that is the original source. So we'll go ahead and read the next few verses. Hebrews 8, 7 through 9. For if the first covenant had been free of fault, no circumstance would have been sought for a second. For in finding fault with the people, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will bring about a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care about them, says the Lord. So here's the question. It seems that what is being implied here by the Hebrew author is that the first covenant is flawed because he says if the first covenant had been free of fault, no circumstances would have sought for a second. So here's my question to you. Is the covenant of Moses flawed? So is the assertion there that you're making that it cannot be flawed because it came from God? That's true. So how do we sync these two ideas? That the first covenant needed to be replaced by a second covenant, which, as Dean was saying, obviously means that it's got a flaw somewhere. But then what Freddie's saying, I think, was actually correct too, which is God set it up exactly the way that he wanted to. How can we both say that it's flawed and yet God made it exactly the way he wanted? Well, the answer, I think, is pretty simple if we really think about it. There is a flaw in the covenant. Who is the flaw with? Exactly. The flaw is not with God. The flaw is with us. And unfortunately, the first covenant had no means to correct that flaw. If you read the first covenant throughout Exodus, when that original first covenant is made, the flaw is, you will obey my commandments, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Well, you don't have to read much further into the Old Testament to realize that didn't last too long. Because very shortly afterward, they were already calling other things gods, they were already worshiping other things, and they were already disobeying God's commands. And so the covenant was not flawed in the sense that the, the written word was imperfect. What was imperfect is that it was set up in such a way that perfection was required to have the, the covenant upheld. And there was one party, humans, that didn't uphold that part of the covenant. And so it is flawed in the sense that there was a party that was in that covenant that was incorrect and the, the covenant had no provision to make up for that shortcoming. And this quotation um, is actually coming directly from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And if you understand the context of Jeremiah and what he's talking about, where you see the, the, the part that's indented and in all caps, that's the, the direct quotation from Jeremiah, you understand that at that point in Israel's history, it was abundantly clear by any honest observer that this flaw was indeed a problem in the covenant because we had seen time and time and time again, there was this cycle that Israel had that just reinforced 
that same problem. So Israel would sin, God would punish Israel, Israel would repent, and then everything would be okay, God would rescue them, and then it wasn't much longer that they would start sinning again. And so this was a cycle that unfortunately kept repeating itself over and over again, and by Jeremiah's time, this was going to be the final punishment by God, or at least the final big punishment by God in the Babylonian captivity and then bringing them back 70 years later. And so if you understand it in the context, it's not only significant what is being said by Jeremiah, but it's also significant that the Hebrew author is quoting that passage from Jeremiah because of the point at Israel's history from which he was quoting is this had been a constant issue with Israel ever since their inception is that they keep falling away from God and keep repenting and then coming back and keep falling away. And it was just a, an unfortunate, constant, vicious cycle. And that's the flaw that he is pointing out here. And uh, by the way, if you want more confirmation, we don't have time to go into it tonight, but if you want more confirmation on this idea that the covenant was flawed or the covenant had shortcomings, uh, a really great part of that, which kind of seems like almost exactly the same argument that we're reading right now, comes from Romans 7, 18 through, uh, sorry, 12 through 18, and then also verse 25. And this is actually one of the reasons that I think that Paul is probably the author of Hebrews is because the arguments are, are very, very similar in the way that they proceed. But regardless, that's uh, one thing that you can look at for further study if you want uh, about this idea of the first covenant being insufficient and that the party that made it was the reason it was insufficient. So Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they will not teach each other his fellow citizen, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful towards their wrongdoings, and their sins I will no longer remember. Notice that in verse 10, there is a sharp distinction drawn between the earlier passage that we read uh, just a few seconds ago where it's talking about Israel and Judah. Now there is no Israel and Judah, it's just Israel. And that's significant as well because in Jeremiah's time, that was seen as what Jeremiah is doing is looking forward to a day where there will be no more distinction between the two kingdoms, the southern and the northern kingdom. But of course, we know that didn't really come to pass. What this is actually looking forward to is the time where there is only one kingdom, one people, and it is the kingdom of God, the kingdom over which Jesus now presides. And so that distinction from verse 8 that we were reading early is completely uh, taken away here where it's talking about in this future Israel that is being talked about that you will have me being their God, they shall be my people, and they're all one people. And so that's an important distinction that sets it apart from what we were reading in verse 8 where it's talking about God's judgment coming upon them. And also the wording here in this language it very carefully mirrors the first covenant. Because in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6, it's talking about uh, the law being written on stone tablets. You know, th this is the covenant which, with which God has made. And so the covenant is written on stone. Moses is going to read that covenant, and then they're going to understand that and say, yes, we agree, this is the covenant that we want to live under. But unlike stone, this law is written, and by its writing, it is known and enacted. You know, nothing wrong with being written on stone tablets, but if I have something that is written on a stone tablet, and I don't read it, what good does it do? If I have it written on a stone tablet, and I read it, but then I don't do it, what good did it do? You see, in this version of Israel. God is writing the law directly on the heart of the citizen, which means that by the very act of writing it, it is received, it is internalized, it is enacted, and it is obeyed. And so that's the difference from the old physical kingdom and the new spiritual kingdom, where God has united the act of writing his law and the obedience to the law. Because there were a whole lot of people in Israel 
that didn't know the law of Moses and some that didn't know it but didn't actually obey it. We even see, for example, King Josiah where they had lost the law for a little while. They didn't, nobody had the law. And then they were finally able to find the book of it in the temple and then they were able to read it to the people. But the point is, in this scenario, the law can't be lost because it is on the heart of the person in which Jesus is dwelling. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good point. In the passage that we were just looking at, it also does imply that this is not a hereditary thing, that it's going to be done on an individual basis, and it's going to happen not as you were born, but at a later date. And so when the law is written on your heart, it's not going to be like old Israel, where you were a member of the nation of Israel just because of who your parents were. This is going to be something where I choose my citizens. And so excellent point to bring up there. So let's look at the last verse in chapter 8, verse 13. When he said, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is about to disappear. So the significance of this argument that the Hebrew author is making is he's saying, look, even Jeremiah knew. Even Jeremiah understood when he said a new covenant is coming that the old covenant was insufficient that it was going to be replaced. And so even Jeremiah treated the Old Testament as inferior. And I think if you're living in Jeremiah's time, there's a reason he's called the weeping prophet. You could kind of understand why that sentiment is there is because he has seen the covenant not be sufficient over and over and over and over again in Israel's history. And this is going to be the worst of them all. This is going to be the Babylonian captivity And so he's looking forward through prophecy and divine revelation to a time where these things will not be necessary, where there is going to be a better covenant that is formed. And what this is really hitting home in in the next chapter that we're going to look at in chapter 9 is really going to emphasize this, this transition that we've been looking at this whole time from things in the physical realm to things in the spiritual realm and the eternal realm. And so that's what is being sort of foreshadowed here is he's saying that even Jeremiah understood there was a time where this thing was going to go away and we're going to have a new and better nation, a better covenant, because he would not say that there's going to be a new covenant. He'd say it you know, would be renewed or we're going to know the law again. He's saying, no, 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 there's going to be a new covenant and then the old one's going to be obsolete. And Jeremiah would not have said that if he believed that the old covenant was going to continue forever. And so it's interesting how the Hebrew author now has gone through every stage of Israel's history and pointed out the inferiority of the old law. He started all the way back with the patriarchs. He moved into Moses and Aaron, then moved forward to David by quoting the Psalms. And now we've moved into him quoting uh, Jeremiah and saying, look, all of these guys, all of these heroes that you uphold from the Old Testament, they were all pointing to Jesus the whole time. So let's go ahead and start on chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was equipped, the outer sanctuary, in which were the lampstand, the table, the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the most holy place. Having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's staff, which was budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above all were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the anointing cover. But about these things we cannot now speak in detail. So in verse 1, notice that all of this is in the past tense. And the reason it's in the past tense is both symbolic and literal. Because when he's talking about it in the past tense in the sense that this is abolished, he's saying, look, as we just discussed and as I just showed you in in plain, well, I was about to say plain English, but I guess it would have been Greek. Uh, (laughs) But he is saying, as I just argued and showed you, the time for those things has passed away. That's the old covenant. We are now in the new covenant. But it's also literal in the sense that all these things that he's describing, those things weren't there anymore. At this point, there was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no tabernacle because they worship in the temple now. And so all of these things are past tense. These are all things that went away. The things of Jesus are never going to go away, and that's part of his point. 
And so when he says that these things had, and he's using the past tense, he's connecting that to the last chapter where he's saying that the, there is a new covenant and the old one is obsolete. And all of these listings and furnishings, if you read through this and you're kind of like, boy, that's a lot to keep up with, I'm right there with you. And, and I love Hebrews and I've read through it several times and even I kind of get lost in this stuff. And if you read through the furnishings in the Old Testament, they're kind of long, they're very detailed, Honestly, they can be a little bit tedious. If you've read through, for example, Exodus 25 through 27, where it talks about the temple regulation, you know, it goes on and on and on about how the different furniture has to be arranged and sanctified and, and what piece of bread goes here and all these different things. And that's actually kind of part of his point. The Hebrew author is trying to bring about this idea and saying, and there's no need for those things anymore. There were all these specifics and everything had to be arranged a certain way and done a certain way. The system under the new covenant is vastly simpler. And part of that is because it is superior. It doesn't need all of these tangible things because it relies on Christ. And so because of that, you don't have to have all these extremely detailed and complex systems of how the temple has to look and how the tabernacle has to be put up and how the furniture has to be cleaned and who has to do it and all those things. You don't need all of that. And the reason you don't need all of that is because now we have Jesus, a mediator that puts us in God's direct presence. And because of that, we don't need any of those things because our priest, who is in the true tabernacle, is superior. So, real quick, and I know that this is a lot, but, but I'll try to keep it short here. What do you think each symbol represents? Because we, we, he mentioned several different symbols, several different pieces of furniture. What do each of these things represent? And I'm not talking about Jesus specifically. I'm saying what is their symbolic importance? Okay, so the provision of God, that's for, for bread. Absolutely. What else? Right, authority and the high priesthood itself. There's the tablets, which would represent the law. And then the gold which traditionally is always associated with royalty. And so that's a, a symbol of God's majesty and his high office. And so in each of these things, gold being royalty, bread being provision, God providing, the staff being a symbol of Aaron, the high priesthood and the authority of God, and then also the tablets being the law, all of these things are symbolized and being kept as a part of the Ark of the Covenant, which, by the way, again, Israel no longer has access to. It's been lost at this point in history. All of those things together are aspects of Christ. So the Hebrew author doesn't go into detail explaining all of that, but all of those things are part of who Jesus is. Royalty, he's a king. Bread, he is the bread of life. He is the provision for mankind. Uh, the staff, he is, as has been discussed at length in this class, He's the high priest. And then the tablets, he is the law. John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was with God and the word was God. And so these are all aspects of Jesus. And so you can look at all of these things and point back to saying every aspect of the Ark of the Covenant, which was the direct contact with God, was symbolic of Jesus Christ. So they, too, were just shadows of things to come. Uh, now, real quickly, let's read verses 6 through 10. Now, when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship, but into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing which is a symbol for the present time, according both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food, drink, and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So what is being discussed here is it's showing the extremity of the separation between the average person and God. Because the average Israelite could walk into the court of meeting, but he was not able to go into the holy place. 
Maybe he catches a glimpse of it here and there when the priest is walking in and out, but that's about all he could ever get to. And he certainly couldn't see into the Holy of Holies because only the high priest went in, into that place and only once a year. And so there's no chance he could even get a glimpse inside that. And so what he's doing is he's pointing out this separation between God and his people. And that separation is not because that's just what God wants or that's just you know a whim that he had. That, there is a reason behind that. But he's pointing out that that separation under the Old Covenant existed and it doesn't exist anymore. These rituals, as important as they were to the Law of Moses, they might teach discipline and they might teach faith, but they didn't undo sin. You know, there's several ways that we could think about this. For example, if you were to say in a marriage, uh, your husband was going to say, well, I did something really bad. I, I kissed another woman today, but I also did the dishes and took out the trash. Okay, kind of glosses over the fact that you did something bad. I mean, it's good that you did good things too, but that doesn't negate the fact that you did a bad thing. And that's kind of the point that the Hebrew author is making here. He's saying, it's not to say these rituals were unimportant or that they serve no purpose, because living your life in that way where you had to constantly be thinking about God and your devotion to Him, that was a good thing. And God instituted that because it served a purpose in training the Israelites to have devotion to Him. But undergoing that ritual did not negate the fact that they were continuing to live in sin and rebel against Him. And so that's the point that he's trying to drive home here is that that separation was still there regardless of the fact that the laws and the rituals were being adhered to. And that's when they were adhering to them. That wasn't always the case. But ultimately, uh, the underlying point of all of this is that it was all carnal in nature. It was all physical. Now we have moved on to the era of the great high priest where all of these things are spiritual and that separation between us and God no longer exists. We are directly in his presence because Jesus is directly in his presence. All right, so we will finish up chapter nine next week. Thank you so much for your time. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.